Have we got a clip? Uh, hi, so uh, I'm here today to talk a bit about modern JavaScript and what it means to be a JavaScript developer in, well, in this modern era. And uh, when I get some slides, um, <laughs> uh, here we go. Cool. So. Um, so before I get into modern JavaScript, it's probably handy to have a quick recap of how, how we got here. And so uh, if we go if we go on a little journey way back into the, the dark ages of the 1990s, um, we hit basically the stone age of JavaScript. And uh, this was a time brought around by the in initial release of JavaScript as um, uh, I believe Mocker and LiveScript from Netscape, and they brought this. They one lone engineer at Netscape knocked out in in a day what has basically become the fundamental platform for the modern web. Sorry, I know uh, knocked out in a week what has become the fundamental platform for the web. Um, this was at some point in 1995, and everything was great until in 1996, Microsoft released JScript, which was a very similar, but not quite the same language, and that's where all the trouble began. JS it was great of them to create something that looked exactly like JavaScript, and it was also horrible of them to create something that looks exact that just looks exactly like JavaScript and didn't actually function very much in the same way under the hood. So you'd end up with a lot of code like this, where you would effectively use nasty browser sniffing things like document.all to work out what browser you were looking at. And then you'd wrap near enough your entire script in an if statement and have one chunk for one browser, one chunk for the other browser, because at that point, none of the others mattered, right? Um, we kind of grew up a little bit after this and moved on. And we got to what I'm calling the Bronze Age of JavaScript. This is when we started to, to think about what we were doing. We started to abstract away all of these little craziness um, we, we put our if statements at a slightly more granular level and would wrap it up in functions and things started to look nice. And at this point, everything was driven by small snippets of code. Um, you go out, you grab this, and to some extent, every JavaScript developer is a framework developer because you go, you grab, all, you grab the snippets that did what you needed to do and you'd assemble everything together into a, into a framework that suited your needs. Um, And this, this went on for quite a while, and then things started to move on again. Um, uh, a little while later, um, Prototype JS came out. This is possibly the only good thing to ever come out of the Ruby community. <laughs> um, <laughs> so th that went well. It, it, it climbed through. It basically was a one-stop shop to solve all of the issues of cross the cross-browser compatibility, compatibility, and all you had to do is drop in this magic JS file and use their sort of syntax. Um, this was this was this was great. It had a good ride until um, John Resig launched jQuery. jQuery suddenly shot to to fame as. It's like prototype was good, but it was messing around with the object prototype, and that in itself had its own problems. jQuery wrapped it up in this whole brand new DSL that didn't touch anything, didn't break anything, and it was all it was all hinged off this one this one variable. So, and so we moved into we moved into this, and this is where we've kind of been for the last uh, five to eight years now, and. And it's, it's served us well, but right now we're, we're standing at the, the forefront of, of the next era. Um, right now, when you look at, the, look at JavaScript, JavaScript is now 18 years old. JavaScript is old enough to drink, and that's scary. Um, but like anything coming of age, it's, it's, it's starting to mature a bit. And, and with that maturity, we're starting, we're starting to see 
it transitioned from, the, we're starting to see the browser transition from being an amazing document reader to what is possibly the, the most widely spread, widely installed, and possibly the most powerful run cross, um, sorry, most powerful application runtime that, that's out there. And to support that, big changes are, big changes are coming. So we're starting to see things in um, ES Harmony, the, the next version of JavaScript. We're starting to get things like modules. We're starting to get sane scoping and all of the things that have been missing in JavaScript until so far. We're starting to see things coming to the browser around JavaScript, like web components that will allow us to define actual component libraries that we can then use to assemble, assemble our interfaces in sane and meaningful ways, rather than, rather than having a, a, a bodge of HTML repeated all over the page. We can actually define these in into tags and make those reusable. We're starting to see templating within the browser. Um, some of these things are even available now. The, the web component stuff, the Google Polymer team have already polyfilled most of the, most of the stuff, the APIs and things that that requires. It's like, we're, start, we're, we're stood now at, this, at this, um, this tipping point where we're about to head into new and exciting territory. And to, for me, I've, I've been coding JavaScript since the 90s, and now is possibly the one of the most exciting times to be a JavaScript developer that I've seen since that those early days. But if we're gonna if we're gonna have these new toys, and we're gonna have um, we're gonna have all these new toys, and we're gonna have all this power and this this responsibility, then we need to start thinking about how we actually do things, and we need to look at we need to look at our processes, and we need to look at we need to look at how we're going to how we're going to move forward. So, a quick poll: um, Who who here uses BD, has BDD test suites for all of their JavaScript code? Let's see a show of hands. Nobody. Who here has BDD test suites for all of their code? For, sorry, for some of their code, um, their JavaScript code. Who here who here has automated tests of some some description for their JavaScript? Huh? Uh, see, who here, who here actually tests test their JavaScript? Who here loads it in a browser and eyeballs it? <laughs> huh? If, come on, there's got to be more hands than that, uh, because if you're not even eyeballing it and just putting it live, then I don't know whether to salute you or slap you. But <laughs> just yeah, that's not good. But all right, so this is the the tools. These tools have exist in the JavaScript world. They're just not embraced. Um, they're not embraced as well as they are in other languages. Not so the Ruby community, the Python community have a heavy focus on testing. Even the PHP community is starting to, to learn about testing. They can, I've, I've even met a few PHP developers who can spell it now. And I say that as a PHP developer myself. Um, but, but it's like when it comes down to it, it's like, does anyone here actually wake up in the morning and they're that excited because they're going to go to work and they're going to fix bugs? Because bugs are amazing and you can't wait to fix bugs and like get to the end of the day and it's time to go home and it's like you're, just, you're fighting with the security guards who are trying to throw you out the office so they can look up because you just want to keep fixing bugs. And it's like, that's not a realistic scenario, right? We don't, we don't do that. We hate bugs. And JavaScript... JavaScript is, is a language where this, this is a big problem because we can build something, we can make it work in, in the one runtime. And that works really well if, if, if you're coding like back-end code and you're doing stuff uh, in Ruby or Python or PHP, and etc. You write your code, it runs on one runtime, and you run your test suite and you check it and it's like, ah, that's fine, it works. But in the JavaScript world, you're running your code on a huge amount of of runtimes, you've got you've got the different browsers, you've got the different versions of browsers, you've got different types types of devices, you've got phones, you've got tablets. It's like, and testing all of those by hand is just craziness. So when we move into to move forward, we need to start embracing testing as a as a first step. And it's like there there are same reasons to do this when you when you work it when you work in a BDD or a TDD style, um, style way. You catch bugs earlier, and this is my, my highly scientific graph of, um, 
of just how frustrating it is to build, to fix a bug over time. So if, you, if you're developing something and something's not working and you're writing that code right now, that's the least frustrating. You know, you know where the code is that's not working. You're looking at it right now. It's in your browser. It's in your um, text editor. It's right in front of you. When it gets to staging, OK, you might remember what you were doing what you were doing at that time. When it gets to production, suddenly it's like it becomes a real pain in the ass. And when, when the bug sort of has slipped under the radar and crops up a month later, then you're, you just want to scream at people when it lands on your desk. And, and so at the moment, we have, we have a, test code, a test code cycle in JavaScript. Unfortunately, it's, it's mostly manual. What we need to do, and it runs in the opposite direction. We start at the coding, then we test, then we code some more, then we test, hopping between our text editor and the browser. We need to flip that relationship to be test, then code. We work out what we want to do, we define what behavior we want, and then we go make it happen. And then, when we, then we can run the test we've just written. When it passes, we know that that works. And not only do we know that that works, we know that's always going to work because as soon as we do anything that breaks it by tweaking some random thing way off on the side that has absolutely nothing to do with that code, we're going to pick up when that magically breaks something. Because and we're going to see it. And it's going to be there in front of us. And we know we can then have a look and see what we did. And we can see how can we do this in a way that's not going to break that or what can we do to fix that crazy breakage over there and and everything else. So, uh, so none of, none of this is really new. Um, TDD has been around since since the 90s. It started off in the small talk community with something called SUnit. Um, it gradually ballooned out of that into other languages, everything else, and unfortunately, it became it became a victim of its own popularity. Um, there are a lot of docs out there on TDD that kind of lead people in the wrong direction. Um, and it was derailed mostly by the fact that people tested their implementation. And this is where those who do write automated tests for JavaScript tend to go a bit astray. And the, the implementation the implementation of, of, of a system doesn't really matter. What matters is the behavior of the system. So the fact that for some, for some inputs, you get the desired output, that's the bit that matters. How you do that along the line, how you, do, how you go through that doesn't really matter. So if you need to fetch some elements from, a, from the DOM, what you care about is that, say, you could give this CSS selector and back, you, and back um, like the three elements you're after. Um, a lot of test code I've seen it will actually test the the jQuery function. The the jQuery function was called with this with this selector, and it's like that we're not overly concerned about because we could at some point want to swap that out. We may want to swap to a we may want to swap to a micro framework, or we may there may be something that comes along in in a few years' time that completely smashes jQuery, and everyone's using using it and finally derails the king and and then we're stuck with a suite of tests that will test that our system's working but it's so tied into our assumptions of how we were going to build things that it doesn't really work so a bit later um, some guys got together and they decided they how can they fix this and they worked out that a lot of the problem was in terminology and they defined BDD BDD is is a form of um, is effectively the bastard child of t TDD, test-driven development, and domain-driven desi design. Domain-driven design is all about working with, um, it's all about looking at the system as a whole, and, uh, sorry. And yeah, so it brought, it brought in new terminology. By th the idea was that if the, if the tools and the terminology are, le are allowing people to easily go astray, then if we fix that, then we're going to get at least halfway there towards things working. So instead of, instead of saying that I want to test that something happens, it was redefined to 
saying it should. So rather than testing things, we're going back to this defining of behaviors. Instead of um, te test the sizzle is called with this CSS selector, what, I'm what I want is to say it should return me a bunch of elements when I pass in this selector. It's, and it's that subtle difference that made a huge difference. Um, so, so all of the, all of this stuff's coming to JavaScript now. With the tools are already have been around for a while. They're they're well established, um, and we we have we have very well written tools for a lot of these things. We're we're possibly trailing only Ruby in in the quality of of, of these testing tools, and this this is in part due to to the express the expressiveness of the job, JavaScript as a language. The fact. And some of the features that we have that just other languages can't compete with. Um, and being able to define nice, nice DSLs and everything else. But um, I know I was, although I know I was mocking Ru Ruby earlier, they do actually have some really nice testing tools. And one of the, one of the best tools I found for, for writing integration and for integration and functional testing to to write tests about the simulate someone using the browser, um, to 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 actually specify it as a test that I can go to a page, I can log in, and when I look, I can when I when I hit the login button, I get a modal that pops up, and that shows me the username and the password field. To define that behavior in that behavior in as as a executable test. Cucumber, Cucumber for Ruby is still one of the best tools you can find, and there is a library called Capybara that adds adds a whole bunch of um, really simple, really simple di methods into Ruby that allow you to simulate this browser thing, and then that will fall down to something like Phantom JS, a, a headless WebKit browser, um, or we'll go off to Selenium, which is a a method of effectively playing Puppet Master to a bunch, bun the various different browsers, and allow you to to perform these operations. So open, opening a page, clicking on links, etc. Um, and it does this through the Gherkin syntax. Gherkin is a syntax designed to allow you to specify biz um, business business logic, the 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 stuff that the stuff that actually matters in the system in a way that is easy to understand and readable. Um, and the beauty of this, this syntax is that it's actually readable by business people. So you can, you can go, you can write this out, and you can give it to a business person and go, right, is this what you want, is this what you want me to build? And they can sign it off, and then off you go and you build that, and you get out of this horrible process of, they, they say they want one thing, you go off, you build it, you take it back, and it's like, ah, Actually, what I really wanted was this, this, and this. So you go off, you do that again, you go back, and you end up in this horrible cycle of them not quite defining what they want, and you constantly going back. This way, you, you specify that out, you go to them, will, can, will you sign off on this? Yes, once they've signed off, then you start working, you deliver it, and then when they, when they come out with the up, but actually, you can be like, no, 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 look, here we go. You signed off on this, this is what you've got. Go off and be happy. Anything else, that's, that's new work. Um, the way this works is that you define a feature. So in this case, this is a very contrived example, but the feature is I want a home page. Um, and then you define the, the business value in order to what, 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 do I, what do I want to do? Um, in order to be the best site on the web, um, and then as a, what, who, who, is this, who is this feature for? So as a web webmaster, um, and then I want, and this is this is the the feature that I actually want out of this, and that's that's that is effectively just an intro to to the thing, and then you would define a bunch of scenarios. So a scenario is a uh, is effectively the actual bit that you're implementing. So in this case, um, the scenario is that when I view the home page, and then I define the process through that. So when I get, when I'm on the home page. 
and I click the greet button, um, then I should see the text hello world. So that's fairly understandable. You can you can read you can read that gi the given when then steps are other bits that are actually executed, um, and you can you can take that to pe someone that isn't a coder and they can fully understand what what's happening there, right? You can understand that w you're on the home page. You click a button and some text is shown, and then back this is backed by a Ruby DSL where we swap in those those steps are powered by regular expressions. We can extract text from those from those steps, and then this is the simple capybara stuff I was talking about. You have one line me simple methods, visit slash. That's the page we're visiting. Click on text that will either click on a link or a button matching that text, and then page dot should have content of text. So. This is how um, uh, there's a bunch of cheat sheets out there that will wrap all this up and make it you can use to to assemble this stuff pretty quickly. And it's like although this is actually a Ruby script, you don't actually need to understand anything about Ruby really to use it, which is one of the things they've done really well. Um, the other great thing about Gherkin syntax tests is there is an app called Relish App. Relish, um, relishapp.com. You can go to the, you can point this at a, at a repo, and it will take all of your t all of your your feature files. It will format them all up nicely and put them up there as readable documentation. So, it, it which is um, which is something I found. If you, if you give that to a man to managers and business people, they will actually read it a lot a lot. Um, uh, they are a lot more willing to read it than they are if you try and give them text files. But uh, on top of this, um, Cucumber Cucumber is basically about interpreting the Gherkin syntax. So there are there are various implementations for it in different languages. There are ones for the JVM, there are ones for PHP, Python, and we have one for JavaScript as well. So this is not quite so fun when you're trying to do simple simple clicking around the browser and testing things but it does come in I found it does come in handy for for some high level testing in say node um, node based apps and things like that so again you can define the same um, the same gherkin style style syntax this is actually from one of my projects I, I managed to get node interpret in brainfuck natively um, but you can you can define you can define the scenarios, um, and then these will now be back in Cucumber JS. Sorry, in Cucumber itself, they were backed by Ru the steps were actually implemented in Ruby. In uh, in Cucumber JS, they they are implemented in JavaScript instead. So not quite as not quite as readable as the Ruby stuff, but. Again, we're defining we're defining things. We're defining um, we're defining our steps as regular expressions, and well, you can either define the steps as regular expressions or pattern strings. Um, the pattern strings is effectively it will look for dollar something, and it will try and substitute that out. Um, everything gets a callback because it's JavaScript. We have the asynchronous overhead to deal with, um, and you can work. You can do pretty much the same sort of stuff. It's just it's not as pretty, it's not as readable, but it does give you that tight tie-in with the JavaScript runtime that is helpful in in node-based in node-based um, environments. Uh, so I've spoken about Cucumber. I said these were good. They were good for integration level and um, functional testing. The trouble with Cucumber though is it's pretty shit for unit level testing. And I would advise against trying to use it. Um, there are great proponents of the Gherkin syntax that will tell you that everything should be Gherkin. They're wrong. <laughs> um, and although you can use it for unit testing, it's it's going to make your life harder than it needs to be. And and I'm lazy. I don't like my life being complicated. I like it being simple. Um, what we do have though is a is a package called Mocker. Um, Mocker is is built by Vision Media. It's the 
is the company behind the Express framework, one of the top frameworks for Node.js. And it works in Node, it works in most, um, most of the modern browsers, including IE and some of the older versions of IE. And it's, it's a implementation um, for anyone coming from a Ruby background, it's more akin to things like RSpec. Um, so going back to the, to the BDD style stuff, we're, we're, descri we're defining behavior, so we're describing something. This is from a, this is, uh, working through a, a br quick example from a URL routing library that I wrote. Um, we, have a, we have a FASA that FASAs, FASAs the, the, the pattern strings and generates regular expressions. But first thing we're going to do is we're going to describe a class because we have, we have a class called FASA. Um, and this, we're describing it. We're, we're describing what's happening. Um, this, has, this has a method called FAS, which we're also going, going to describe. Um, the there are some uh, there are some conventions around the formatting of this thing. So classes are always started with capitals. Um, instance methods start with a hash, which I believe is some weird hangover from small talk days. Uh, class class methods start with a period. Um, brackets at the end for a method. Uh, no brackets for a for a variable. And so. All of this stuff is up there documented, and you can see it in most of the examples that you'll find. But, but yeah, in our case, we're defining our files method. And OK, so, we've, so so far, looking at this, we can tell we have a class. It has a method. And then we get into what it should do. So it should compile simple paths, um, paths. And then we get into implementation steps, so filling in some of the um, so stuff there, we add we add our code to to run that test into into the into the method, and then we we have some assertions at the end to to validate what has happened happened as we expected. Um, I'll get into the assertions in a bit, but uh, but um, there are there are three there are three main way. Um, Syntaxes for doing the assertion stuff. The first is, an ass is the assert style. Um, this actually comes baked into Node.js and is importable. You can use that straight off the bat. Um, there's the expect style. That, that gives you a more BDD style description, description um, syntax. And then there is the way that extends object or prototype, which should probably be avoided if you don't want future colleagues to hate you. Um, I personally like the assert style. Um, if you're going to use the expect style, there is a great library called Chai. Chai will Chai provides all three of those syntaxes, and you just choose which one you want, and it will handle it for you. Um, uh, so, the other handy thing you can do is right, we all we all um, hate code repetition. We want to dry dry up our code, etc., and we can do that with our tests as well. There are four methods in, in Mocha. There is before, after, before each, and after each. Um, the before method will run as the very first thing in, that runs in a described sort of block. Um, and any function you pass to before will get executed first. And the same with after. That will be executed after any child steps um, that you've defined. You also have before each and after each. This will fire before every method that's passed to an it me method. So in this case, before, before each of our, our um, requests, we're going to instantiate an instance. And this, this just means that we have simple, um, uh, sorry. This this reduces the amount of code in our actual tests, so that the tests become the shorter the tests are, the easier they are to to understand as you're sort of skimming over. Uh, okay. So, one of the key things you want to you want to do when in your test as well is you don't really want to want to be testing the entire stack at once. So you want to you want to sort of simulate your dependencies. Um, 
And this is this is done with something called for a process called mocking. Um, mocking is is the is the process of creating a object or function that looks exactly like the one you want to use, and then using that instead and inspecting the things that were sent to it and how it how it was interacted with. Um, there's a great library for JavaScript called Synon. Um, this will do most of the deal with most of your mocking needs right down to uh, redefining time itself and allowing you to do in allowing you to test set interval based code and um, dates and everything else. But at its core is um, is what it calls spies. Spies are basically a function that you can you can call and later on you can e you can expect what it was called with. You can expect that it was called. You can expect what it was called with. How many times it was called. Uh, and th these are really good for 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 overriding callback functions. You also have stubs. Stubs are stubs are like like spies, but a little bit more useful. You can define return values. Um, you can say when it's called with these methods, then it should return this, and when it's called with those ar those arguments, it should return that. And and they're, they're, they're just a little, that little bit more smarter. Um, and then you, then you have mocks. Mocks are, mocks are really, comple uh, really complex versions of the previous, where you can actually take an existing object and go, I want this, but I want to start overriding these few methods on it, and I want it to function like, and it will look at that, it will work out what it needs to do. And then you can actually define all of the behaviors that are going to happen on the mock, and at the end just go, did this, did this do what? Did this do what I ex I expected it to? So in this case, it's expecting uppercase to be called, expecting it to be called once, and when it gets called, it's to return, it's to return foo, in uppercase. Um, so we can call that, and then at the end we say verify, verify that this works, and if not, it's going to throw some assertion errors. Uh, if you're working with Node, um, Synon will work in your browser in or and on Node. If you're working in Node itself, sometimes you want to override some of the default menu, uh, sorry, default modules. So you n you might want to be able, you might want to mock out the fact that the file system is there and have that handled entirely within your code. And mockery is a way of of just going here is here is a bunch of functions I want when I include this module I want it to protect I want this to come back for the purpose of this test I want to pretend that this is what's in that module <coughs> and it's a way of just limiting the outside influences on your code your your test so that you can test that test it in isolation uh, um, the other great thing about test suites is that you if you're working, if you're working on JavaScript on the back end, you can also gener generate coverage reports that will tell you just how much of your code you have tested. Um, you can see the bits that aren't well tested. You can go and fix that. Uh, and the best thing about the best thing about Mocker is that it has a Niancat reporter. And this has actually been one of the best things I found for selling testing to people because the more tests you write, the bigger a rainbow. This this everyone's favorite pop tart cat is going to shit across your console window. And who, it's like, look at it, it's like, a, it's a cute little ASCII cat. Would, do you want to make that unhappy? <laughs> um, on more serious, as more serious um, reporters, I generally tend to use this one for most things, but we also have the um, fact that we can generate some, some semi-readable human, fr or semi-human friendly um, Output from our test suite as well. Not quite, not quite as friend business p person friendly as the um, as the feature files, but definitely developer friendly. We can look at this. We can see the e the expectations of each method and each um, and each thing, and that can help us to get up and get new people up and running quickly. Uh, uh. And the other thing it can do is it can actually watch your test, your test folder and your code folder. And as you make changes, it can automatically run your tests and tell you that thing that um, can tell you whether things are passing, whether things are failing, and whether or not you need to pay attention. So just having a a notification in the corner, and you then you don't even have to pay attention to the test. You just keep an eye out. I make t I make 
I write it, I see the, I write a test, I see it fails, I implement it, I see it passes, I can move on and I don't have to, I don't even have to move out of my text editor until something goes wrong at which point I've been notified and I can dive into that properly. And as I said, the great thing about this is oh, this has been, all the examples so far have been, um, been node based, but this works equally well in the browser. Uh, here we have a a mocker test that is requiring something through require.js, requiring a module through require.js. Is later using that mod, using um, the return, f the class returned by that module, instantiating it and running a test. And and when you run it in the browser, you get a nice output in the browser, a big report similar to the to the one I showed you in the console earlier, telling you what has passed, what's failed, and uh, with some hacky, hacking, you can also hook this up to a automated test runner like Jenkins and get this running every time you check in, and that makes like ops people really happy. Uh, so, so I covered a bit on testing. The other thing that we need to start doing is uh, the majority of JavaScript projects I've worked on. You can look through the code and you can work out who wrote what based on the style of the code. And this is not a this is not a particularly good way to be working for a for a in a good project. All code looks like it was written by one person. Um, it does. It's a mixture of different styles, and that have been agreed on. And that that is then how. Sorry, it's a uh, it's a set of styles that have been agreed on by the team, and then you move through, and everyone writes code in that style. It all goes together. Every this has the benefit of once you get used to this style, you can look at the code and it's it make ev other people's code makes as much sense as yours. <coughs> and to enforce this, you, we have tool we have um, linting tools. Linting tools will inspect the code, the syntax. We'll look at how things are laid out. We'll look at things that aren't quite right, and and will tell us when things aren't up to scratch. Um, for this, I highly recommend JS Hint. Um, the the other option would be JS Lint, but I I would highly recommend JS Hint because Crockford is not always right, and JS Lint is incredibly opinionated. Um, I use JS Hint basically because I find prefix and commas um, in JavaScript plays a lot nicer with version control systems, and JS Hint JS Lint will not stop moaning at me about it. Whereas I can tell JS Hint that I'm doing this intentionally, and it will then be fine with it. It's a lot more configurable and tweakable to to the styles that you you within your team have decided that you're going to adhere to. Uh. And the other thing is, um, we see a lot of tools out out there in the JavaScript community, Grunt, Cake, Cake um, Jake, and all of these all of these things. But I'm still I'm I'm still old school. I like make files. But to be honest, it doesn't matter what you write it in. Just writing this up as as a set of easy, rerunnable commands, so that anyone can get going quickly, is a use, is a useful endeavor. So here, basic one from one of my projects that I can write make test. It tests all my tests everything. I can write test watch. It will start shooting little notifications at me. I can generate a coverage report. Um, and I can lint things. And I don't actually have to remember all of the commands to do that. Uh, so, so we've covered that. We've covered like things around how we code and what we're doing. The, the other thing that we are really, really bad at is documentation. So what I'd like to say is instead of read, read the fucking manual, write the fucking manual because this, this, the biggest problem we have is that there isn't in with most of our libraries and things is there's no ma there's no manual of any substance to read, um, and the, there are no decent API docs um, and things. And we can borrow, like I like I was encouraging the borrowing of of um, of Cucumber from the Ruby community. The Python community has a tool called Sphinx, which which is a really good um, documentation tool. And 
you basically define all of your documentation, your API docs, in in something called restructured text. It's a bit. It's it's one of these languages along the lines of Markdown and Textile. Um, it was very popular way back when Python was kicking off, and a lot of its docs are written in this. But um, but Sphinx, Sphinx is fairly unopinionated in how you how you document things. So although it was built for the Python community, all of the Python-related things are are wrapped up in a bundle which they call domains. And you have a Python domain, and, but you also you also have a JavaScript domain, which allows us to to define that. Um, when you enable the JavaScript domain, we can define that we have we have a class, and it has a function. It has parameters. It throws certain exceptions, and it returns something. And we can specify all of this out. And when you do it in this this fashion, um, you can then generate nice HTML documentation. And there's even a web service for hosting that will, if you're writing open source code, that will pull your Sphinx documentation from your app, from your GitHub repo, it will compile it all into pretty HTML and it will put it up there for anyone to read. And it will do this for every version you release. You don't even have to remember to compile and upload the documentation. It all happens for you. Um, any good ops person can make that happen inside the business as well. But it's a really nice service though. And, and if you want to take it, if you'd like to take it that little bit further, um, whenever, I, whenever I'm writing a module for a, a new JavaScript library, I follow a practice called documentation-driven development. Um, this, in this case, I will sit and I will write the API documentation first because there's no point in writing a whole bunch of code then getting to the end and realizing that the API you've defined sucks and nobody's actually going to understand it. So this way I can iterate on what the, out, the, the end API looks like, figure that out, and then from that, write my BDD specs, write mocker test, write um, Cucumber features, get all that working, write the code, and then at the end of that, I have really high fidelity documentation for my, um, really nice documentation for my, for my module. Everything's well tested, and I can be sure that it will work fine. But uh, I think that's that's most of what I've prepared. But do we have any questions? Yep. Uh, sorry, there should be a mic somewhere. <coughs> I've heard a bit about um, Karma, which used to be Testacular, I think. Sorry. Um, I've heard a bit about Karma. Have, do you know that test runner? Um, uh. Carmen, I'm Karma. I'm not. I'm not over familiar with that one. Okay, and also, um, I think uh, Jasmine as yeah. well. Jasmine, I've, Jasmine, I know. Jasmine is is handy. Um, the trouble with Jasmine is it doesn't run so well server side. So if you're going to learn a, it it func it everything Jasmine can do, Mock can do everything Mock can do, Jasmine can do. It's they they both fit in the same space. But if you're going to learn one, you might as well learn the one that will function best everywhere, mm -hmm. as opposed to the one that will function in the browser. Sure. Um, and not so well outside of it. But so uh, does that uh, does that help? Or yeah, yeah, that's fine. That's great. Thanks. Cool. Do you have any other questions? Uh, uh, nothing. <laughs> Uh, I'll take it that I've, I've either explained everything great or I've put everyone to sleep, either way. <laughs> uh, thank you. All right, next up will be Keith Moon, iOS development. People interested, please stay, and we're starting at 11 a.m. <laughs> 